Hello and welcome to In Bold, the podcast brought to you by Strategy and Middle East team. This podcast series lifts the lid on some of the most important topics impacting the Middle East region and globally. We talk to experts to understand what's behind key trends and exciting opportunities, making the most of their knowledge and expertise to get the key insights that make a difference. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us on this journey. We're excited to learn more together. The first topic we're going to explore is the gaming industry. And I'm really excited that this is the first of two conversations with some real experts on the topic. So I'm going to introduce Alexander and Johnny. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves. And I'd love to know a little bit more about you guys. Who are you and how are you? You know, it's been a difficult couple of years for everyone. An interesting couple of years with the pandemic. It's changed things a lot. So I'd love to know how you're doing, where you're based, what you're working on, and who you are. Alexander, could I ask you first? Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. So I am Alexandre Salem. I am based in London and I am French, Egyptian, British. I, in the last two years, I, I have uh, enjoyed a lot uh, the flexibility offered by the COVID time. I have traveled quite a lot and I, it allowed me basically to work from many sunny places that I didn't know previously. And it also allowed me to hone new skills. I learned to play the oud, which is a Middle Eastern uh, instrument, but I also started cooking more and more. In terms of like gaming expertise, so I spent the last seven years of my career um, in different exec roles uh, at King, the developer of Candy Crush, where I was a business performance director. Then I shifted to Google, where I was managing the gaming partnerships team uh, across Europe, Middle East and Africa. Uh, then I, I became a director globally for Huawei Gaming Partnerships team. And uh, I just joined Steelfront as a senior uh, vice president for operations. Thanks for that, Alexandra. That's, uh, that's quite a thing. How do you balance cooking, playing the oud and, uh, and playing games? How do, you, how do you find that? The reality is that I, it's a bit chaotic, so I don't really have such a great organization skills. So I, I end up just going with the flow and uh, I am quite happy with the way it is. So uh, I just try to prioritize whatever comes uh, from the emails. And when I have like a few hours in the middle of the day or at the end of the day, I, I try to play music to change my mind uh, or to cook for my friends. Sounds great. Well, welcome, Alexander. Thanks for joining us. Johnny, turning to you, um, you are our resident expert on gaming with strategy and Middle East. I've, I've read some of the, uh, the white papers that um, you've written on the topic about the gaming opportunity and, and skin in the game. Tell us a bit more who you are and, and how you are. Thanks, Jonathan, and thank you for having me. So name is Johnny Aku. I'm a principal in the telecom media and technology practice at strategy and been with the firm for almost 11 years now. Uh, mostly working with telecom and tech players uh, throughout the Middle East. So I'm based out of Dubai, but I you know, travel all over the region uh, pretty much, at least pre-pandemic. And you asked, how has it changed with the pandemic? So there's less travel uh, for business purposes. Working remotely has been quite good in the sense that, yeah, you can pick up some, uh, some hobbies, you can have a more let's say, stable lifestyle. So I see Alexander flaunting his music skills. I might as well do so as well. I've uh, re remembered, let's say, my guitar uh, guitar skills. So you could see me shredding some uh, Guns N' Roses solos here and there in between my calls. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and yeah, I've been dabbling in, in like the world of uh, gaming, decentralized gaming, uh, NFTs, crypto, etc., which is, you know, a lot of what we'll be talking about now key turning point in which had me kind of develop my interest in gaming was I was doing my MBA at, uh, at Columbia in New York and the guys behind Oculus were on campus uh, showing off their latest uh, content. So after Facebook bought them out, uh, they so several of the founders actually left and to focus on developing content for VR headsets. And so they gave us a like a sneak peek of what's in store. Uh, that was back in 20, 2015, actually. So, uh, yeah, that kind of piqued my interest. And uh, here I am dabbling in this uh, since then. It's fascinating, isn't it? It's fascinating how it's growing, how it's um, it's a topic that uh, you read so much about uh, recently, you know, with recent acquisitions and development. I mean, I was blown away to learn that it's worth, you know, more than 170 billion US dollars a year. 
I mean, that's, and it's growing. Some estimates put it at like, um, I mean, you, you guys are the, the experts, you'll tell me, but you know, it's going to be well over $200 billion uh, in the next few years. Help me understand a bit better, help us understand, you know, put this in real terms. How can you illustrate how big gaming has become? How has it grown? Is it, is it a pandemic thing? Is it just the rise of adoption of digital platforms? You know, why has gaming become so big? Personally, I would say that, first of all, gaming has always been pervasive and uh, it's fundamentally one of the preferred human activities uh, for thousands of years. Um, so I don't believe that gaming introduced a new uh, paradigm in terms of um, engagement. What I do believe, though, is that the COVID-19 and the lockdowns which were associated to uh, COVID-19 have catalyzed some underlying trends, which are the fact that uh, gaming is shifting increasingly towards digital. And it's also more and more uh, acceptable um, in mainstream media and even like private circles, like say friends and family to say, oh, I like gaming. Uh, you know, when I grew up as a teenager, um, the cliche, the, the prejudice against gaming was quite strong. It was supposed to be an activity, a type of entertainment, which was for, you know, young male nerds, basically. And, uh, you know, over the last uh, two decades, I would say that uh, this has shifted completely, not in terms uh, only of uh, data. We know that uh, nowadays everyone plays across gender, across generation, across uh, uh, social status. But also, like, I think there is an increasing acceptability in the wider society, uh, if you look at the mainstream media, such as, you know, The Guardian, The Financial Times, Le Monde, you have more and more regular uh, features about the gaming trends. Um, uh, politicians got, get more and more involved uh, in the gaming communities. I, I am thinking, for example, of AOC, Alejandra, uh, the politician, the New York um, politician who used, for example, the Twitch community to, to raise awareness about her platform. So bottom line, I think um, what uh, COVID-19 did is increase this space of greater acceptability and greater engagement, greater revenue in gaming. But this was already like a, a massive industry previously. Super interesting. And I guess I mean, one thing I thought when you were talking there, Alexander, is I guess, I mean, historically or going back to that sort of prejudice cliche of the nerd, it was a solitary activity. You know, you were on your own in your bedroom and now it's increasingly a very social activity. I mean, you can connect with people all over the world and develop that. Johnny, is that the right way to think about it? And also, can you um, pick up my numbers from the beginning? Was that the sort of, the, correct me if I was wrong with those kind of 170 billion, 200 billion plus kind of estimates? Estimates are spot on, plus or minus. I mean, we're talking in the 180 or so billion uh, for this uh, this year, 2022. Just to give it uh, some perspective, this is bigger than like the box office, music, and North American sports industries all combined. So it is a massive, massive industry. And as Alexandre was was rightfully saying, it's been as large for quite a few years now, or decades actually. But it's, it's come more into, let's say, uh, the headlines more recently with like a lot of acquisitions, a lot of, a lot of trends, uh, people staying at home because of the pandemic. So it's become more of a social phenomenon where people are sharing their time while playing games, you know, pandemic driven family gameplay, uh, people, uh, families playing their games together. Uh, appeal to diverse audience, as Alexandre was saying. So it used to be a more of a geeky thing in your basement playing Dota till 4 a.m. But, you know, with mobile gaming and everyone is connected uh, these days uh, with a mobile device and interconnection, uh, demographics or a broader base of, uh, of the demographic population have access to games these days. And, uh, you know, talk about females, uh, old people, everyone has a phone and is hooked to a game. Uh, these days. So th this is what the pandemic, I think, kind of like accelerated or, or kind of shifted us three, four years uh, mm -hmm. into the future. And uh, this was accompanied by a lot of uh, key offerings from, uh, from these industry players. So, mm -hmm. for example, you see these massive concerts inside, inside games. You know, you, Travis Scott made this huge concert in, uh, in Fortnite, I believe, 18 or so million viewers at the same time, which concert have you ever seen with 18 million attendees? They were all in there virtually in that, uh, in that party spot, uh, uh, let's say. Big retailers are jumping in, you know, Louis Vuitton have their 
avatars. They're launching their own games, actually. Uh, so it, everyone is joining in on the action. And it, it's so decentralized that uh, anyone with a, with a camera and the, and the device can, can become like a hotshot in the gaming world. You know, streamers can do so from their, uh, from their, uh, from their couches at home. Uh, live streaming to to thousands and millions of people. So it's uh, this is what really kind of like cat- catalyzed and uh, propelled the industry forward. It's it's this perfect storm of supply and demand factors uh, combining with the pandemic. People stuck at home, and it kind of like exploded in the last uh, couple of years. So to to build on the point of um, uh, Johnny, so a few years ago, uh, the CEO of uh, Netflix, uh, Reed Hastings, he was asked uh, by an equity research analyst what he was perceiving as the main competition to Netflix. And uh, Reed Hastings, he surprised the audience by saying the biggest competition to Netflix is actually in Fortnite. It's not Disney, it's not HBO Max, it's it's Fortnite and in, in general gaming. And... Back in the day, I remember the, the reaction of the investment community was quite surprised. And nowadays, I mean, nobody would dare to put into question this statement because uh, it is quite clear that there is a convergence across the different media verticals. There is a global competition for eyeballs and for the entertainment time. And it is quite clear that whether you are into music, into cinema, into um, gaming, everyone is basically fighting for the, the, the audience time. And this has become like a, a huge fight for our attention. And I think, uh, yeah, Netflix was a precursor into that. So to, to put that um, in line with what Johnny was saying, yeah, definitely I believe that uh, gaming is now eating the world. And uh, that's why we, we can basically say that uh, we are getting into the third big era of gaming. So 20, 30 years ago, gaming was basically a box that you were buying in a store. Um, so uh, think of uh, Zo- uh, Doom, you remember when we were teenagers? So you were mm-hmm. buying a box and you, you, you would have this game at home. Uh, then uh, from product, gaming became a service. So you could go on the App Store, download a game for free through the freemium innovation. Uh, But then this game was uh, permanently updated through new updates from the developer. And now we are in this third era where gaming has become this um, like all capturing holistic experience and gaming has become a lifestyle, uh, uh, basically similar to a social network. When you go in sandbox games such as um, you know, uh, Roblox or, or or Fortnite, you can, as Johnny was saying, you can uh, attend a business meeting, you can attend a concert, you, you can attend an esports competition, you can play, you can chat, you can date, you can find a job. And uh, I find this evolution absolutely fascinating. And that's also why you have more and more brands indeed, which also go there to catch the attention of the mm-hmm. audience. So up until now, we've been speaking about the sort of the global gaming picture, the global phenomenon. If we just bring it back to the Middle East region for a moment. And um, Johnny, let me ask you first because of your of these uh, white papers that you've written. So what's the um, what's the opportunity within the Middle East region? And is, what are there any sort of specific uh, dynamics in the region that perhaps are a little different from the global picture? So I think the opportunity by and large is, is localization of content. Uh, so gaming, you see, the, you can kind of like see two clear uh, cliques in the gaming world. You have like the Western world in, of gaming and you have the Asian world of gaming. And like the Middle Eastern world is kind of stuck in between uh, getting hooked onto games of either of the first two worlds, let's say. And We've seen this among our among our clients that there's there's this thirst for for local games, either actually translated into Arabic or full storylines, gameplay, and settings that are that actually happen in the uh, in the Middle East. So this has been uh, this has been an untapped area of uh, of potential, let's say, in in the Middle East. And so yeah, everyone is trying to 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 kind of like tap into this. It's mm-hmm. easier said than done, but the ultimate objective is uh, what, what Alexander hinted at as well, is capturing more of the disposable time of, of people. So yeah. you cannot think of it alone as, as uh, gaming on its own. So we see this among our clients. They're, they're tech players. 
they're uh, big telecom operators, but they have a relationship with customers and they want to make it stronger. They want to retain their customers and they want to capture new ones and, you know, monetize more of their base. And gaming, just like media, for example, you know, streaming, etc., is another avenue for, for these big players to, to further, let's say, solidify their, their hold of their customers, give them good services and monetize more and more and retain them for the longer. It's a great way to kind of capture the younger, uh, the younger base of the population through gaming. So it's also a bet on the future. If you win over uh, your clients uh, when they're young and they're 15 and 20 years old, that gives you uh, the brand equity to keep them hooked onto your ecosystem uh, for a longer period of time. Am I right in thinking that you know, there's a particular opportunity in the Middle East, given the, the youthful demographic there? Definitely, definitely. I mean, it's a predominantly youthful population and gaming is huge in the Middle East. Uh, you see champions like, uh, like MS Dosri winning the FIFA, FIFA competition worldwide. Uh, there's, the potential is there, but historically it's been, uh, I'm not going to say frowned upon, but it hasn't been, it was always uh, looked at in the sense that, you know, gaming is not a job. Gaming is just for lazy people, let's say. And in the last couple of years, we've been seeing significant focus uh, on gaming. You know, the social stigma is kind of fading away. Mm -hmm. And you see these huge national mandates to push on gaming, be it yeah. establishing, like incubating uh, gaming uh, development firms uh, in-house in Saudi Arabia, for example, establishing esports venues, uh, bringing in top talent, top athletes, top teams to compete, uh, kind of like positioning themselves as the the mecca of gaming in the, in the region and worldwide as well. So definitely uh, all, the, all the wins are, are pushing in the direction of having this uh, Middle Eastern gaming ecosystem explode in growth. And uh, I think this is a, definitely a space to watch in the near future. So uh, per personally, I was lucky to organize the first ever gaming summit of Google um, in the Middle East. And the reason why we invested massively in such a dedicated event in the region is that we perceived that there was a huge mismatch between what we, we saw as uh, like an appetite for gaming content and on the other hand, the level of the supply. Um, I remember this, this was a day where basically, I mean, this was around 2018, where basically a lot of people um, wanted to, to play a certain franchise uh, game, but the content was just not available in Arabic. And um, mm -hmm. so Johnny mentioned that there is a young uh, demographic um, uh, differentiation in the Middle East, lots of young people who are tech savvy, who love gaming. But I would also add that um, there is also something else which uh, plays in favor of the development of gaming. Uh, in my view, it's the strong motivation from the local uh, governments and regulators to kind of uh, push for an economic agenda um, which will take into account that oil and gas is going to diminish over time and that we need to develop uh, other sources of revenue. And for mm -hmm. me, there is a news which perfectly reflects that in the last few days. It's the announcement that uh, the PIF, so the Sovereign Fund of Saudi Arabia, uh, has created from scratch uh, the Savvy uh, Group, which is an initiative to um, basically build uh, a healthy ecosystem uh, in the Middle East for uh, development of games, but also for esports. And uh, it was also revealed at the same time that uh, there would be an acquisition by the Savvy Group of ESL, which is a leading esports uh, events organizer. So I think this is just um, the beginning of the development of gaming in in the region. Uh, we have already some few um, like success stories in the region with Jordan and the UAE, which have managed to to build successful small ecosystems. But I think it's really the uh, the, the start of this uh, trend. Um, I am really excited by uh, some developers in the region like Jawaker, like Babel Games, uh, like Tamatem, uh, but I think there is much more space for uh, many more. It's fascinating. Yeah, uh, Sorry, go on, Johnny. Yeah, just to, just to follow up on this, Alexander, fully agreed. The, the focus that we've been seeing on, uh, on pushing the national agendas or mandates for gaming in the region has been you know, stronger than ever. Uh, you see this uh, in, the in the latest acquisitions, exactly, you know, the creation of Savvy Group and the, the couple of acquisitions that they made. This has started a few years ago, actually, if you think about it, like PIF, the Saudi uh, Public Investment Fund, 
they revealed huge stakes in Activision Blizzard, which, as we all know, got recently acquired by Microsoft for a massive $69 billion uh, uh, acquisition value. So uh, the interest in gaming to diversify ha- is, has, is longstanding. And now we're actually in the center of discussions as to how to take it, to take it forward. You know, okay, we've been investing, we, we, have, a, we have a vision, we know where we want to go. But how do we get there? What are actually the building blocks to actually, you know, bring launch Saudi specifically and the Middle East in general into mm-hmm. becoming the epicenter of, of gaming uh, in the world? So they have global ambitions. And this is something impressive. And uh, it's, it's actually great to be part of uh, in the region at this point in time. It's very exciting to hear. So, you know, we've, we've talked about the massive global opportunity. We've talked about the, the opportunity in the region. And this is not just being led by developers now. It's already getting sort of the attention of leadership and, and political support. So the future looks very exciting. You've mentioned it sort of a little bit already, but I'd like to draw out a bit more the opportunity and the interest from parties beyond developers themselves. What's the opportunity there and how do non-developers achieve uh, success in in terms of their own objectives uh, in the gaming space? So I would start by answering the question, why is there uh, an interest for gaming uh, from non-gaming developers? And and then I can go deeper basically into the typology of uh, stakeholders who are getting in. So first of all, like why is there such an interest for the gaming vertical coming from out of it? Uh, I think the gaming vertical is very unique. Uh, we've discussed already about the $178 billion revenue. Uh, as Johnny was uh, referring to, uh, gaming is now much bigger than uh, all of the cinema bookings plus music together. Uh, so it's just an indication of how big it has become. In terms of engagement, um, gaming is also absolutely unique. People uh, spend hours and hours across platforms playing games. So it's a very high engagement activity. Um, but th- there are other very uh, clear characteristics of gaming. Um, there is a virality of gaming. Um, so it's, uh, sorry for the gaming jargon, but it's called the medical slow. So it's basically a measurement of the virality of gaming. So the idea is that if someone likes a game, you can go and stream it on YouTube and on, or, or on Twitch. And very quickly, without even investing in user acquisition, you can end up uh, having like a quite cool audience, a very highly engaged audience. So that distinguishes gaming from other types of uh, entertainment uh, vertical. Uh, another characteristic of gaming, uh, which puts it completely apart, is what I would call the time leverage of gaming. Uh, I will take a concrete example to, to explain uh, this concept. Um, Supercell has, be, has been for the last uh, decade um, the, one of the most successful um, developers uh, globally on mobile with uh, franchises such as Clash of Clans or Boom Beach or Heyday. And uh, they have a handful of games which have uh, surpassed a billion dollar uh, revenue uh, across platforms. And up to a few years ago, they had less than 200 employees. Um, Compare that with any uh, cinema studio or music label where basically it's, those are also heat driven businesses, but you need much more costs, uh, capex and opex to get there in terms of revenue. So in other words, yeah, gaming um, has a much higher uh, time leverage in terms of like, the comparison of the time engagement versus the time which has been spent creating the content. And that's, I I think, uh, makes it a very appealing uh, vertical. And the the last part uh, about what makes gaming absolutely unique is is basically the the fact uh, that it has become similar to a social network, as I was saying previously. So in other words, people use more and more, especially in the Gen Z, uh, gaming as a way to socialize, to meet new people, to interact with brands. And um, it has become basically a lifestyle. And uh, there is no comparison in other entertainment vertical. So uh, this, I think, uh, can serve as a a basis to answer your question, uh, Jonathan, because we see indeed like very wide spectrum of stakeholders who want to get involved. So you have governments, uh, first of all, and regulators who want, for example, to deal with antitrust issues. Uh, So we are going to see what will will be decided, for example, with the Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal. 
Uh, we see also governments get, getting involved because they realize it can be used as a way to incentivize people to, to have a certain behavior. We've seen, like, for example, games being used to uh, raise awareness about COVID-19 uh, health, um, I mean, recommendations. Um, so that's government and regulation. We have then the investment um, stakeholders. So you see more and more gaming money into uh, venture capital. You see in, in, institutional investors getting there because the returns are quite attractive in gaming. But you also have like uh, the classic big tech companies which uh, realize that um, the engagement and the revenue opportunity is unique in gaming. And that's why you have basically all the, the big tech companies uh, in the US, of course, but also in Asia, who are getting there. Uh, Tencent is, for example, one of the biggest investors globally in the gaming ecosystem, whether in terms of console, PC, or mobile. But you have also Google, for example, because beyond uh, Google Play, uh, which is a famous example, but Google has many more interests in gaming. They have Stadia, which is a cloud gaming platform. They have um, of course, Google Ads for the user acquisition. They have the cloud, which is leveraged by a lot of uh, gaming developers. They have AdMob for the gaming monetization. Uh, they have YouTube for the streaming of uh, games. Uh, so bottom line, um, yeah, big tech is also massively going there. And I would finish with the brands. Um, so Johnny was referring to some high fashion brands, which are, uh, for example, uh, Louis Vuitton had built some skins which are used in League of Legends. Uh, Fortnite has attracted a lot of uh, uh, big uh, brands which want to acquire or retain some users. Uh, McDonald's had uh, interacted, uh, for example, with uh, Pokemon Go uh, in, in Japan. So in order to get some Pokemons, you need to go into a McDonald's. And uh, I, I thought this was a very smart way to optimize traffic into the stores. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I would say that the spectrum of uh, new stakeholders is absolutely huge, but this needs to be understood in in the lens, through the lens of uh, the specificity of gaming versus other types of entertainment. And you have a bit less than 3 billion gamers in the world. So any entity, any organization, any company whatsoever would want a piece of this. It's almost, you know, a third, if not more, of, of uh, humanity. So it's, it's, uh, it's really so large that you cannot ignore it. And if you want to you know, innovate to your customers, you want to keep your brand out there, whatever space you operate in, uh, you need to be pretty much in, uh, have, a, have a foothold in gaming, whether you through partnerships, advertisements, sponsorships, events, you know, it's, it's just a vast world and it mimics the real world at this point, uh, without even mentioning esports and how those dynamics uh, mm. uh, typically uh, pan out. It's super interesting. Guys, I could talk to you all day, um, but I'm amazed how quickly the, the time is going. I have a rapid fire question for each of you before uh, I let you go and uh, go about your days. First one, just uh, uh, shake it up a little bit. So um, Alexandra, when you're not working, when you're, you're clearly passionate about gaming, but when, when it's not for work, when it's not for investment or anything, else, when you're just gaming yourself, what do you turn to? Do you destroy zombies? Do you play FIFA? Do you reach for the Fortnite control? What's what's your game of choice? So since my childhood, I've been like a, a very usual uh, fan of FIFA. Uh, it allows me to to display how Marseille is uh, the best team in the world. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't uh, won any title in real life for many years, so I can at least uh, make them win in uh, virtual worlds. So that's my way of uh, being a good fan of Marseille. But uh, otherwise, on mobile, I've been really impressed uh, lately uh, by Royal Match, which is incredibly uh, well polished. It's a match three game. You can think of it as a new version of Candy Crush, but with very well balanced uh, uh, levels. There is a game also I played, but more for understanding the Web3 gaming potentialities. It's uh, Axie Infinity that I was <laughs> referring to earlier. It can give a good idea of what uh, crypto gaming can open in terms of doors for the future. Super. Johnny, same question to you. What do you play for fun? So I'm a, quite an avid gamer. I think I've gone through every type of genre throughout my life. Uh, used to be a massive role-playing game and real-time strategy fan. So Elder Scrolls Oblivion, for example, Diablo, etc. on the first and uh, more on the strategy uh, front, StarCraft, WarCraft, etc. Time doesn't permit these days. So uh, I'm a FIFA guy. 
it's always nice to uh, to vent out on a on a on a on a game of uh, FIFA with a, a friend or three. So with my team, actually, we've been playing Call of Duty Mobile a lot, especially in pandemic days when everyone everything was locked down. I think I got everyone hooked onto it uh, from the most junior to the most senior uh, folks. Uh, it's always it's nice. You can even talk work while on while uh, using the audio of the game if need be. So uh, yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you, gentlemen. Johnny, Alexander, thanks so much for your time today. It was a fascinating conversation. I certainly learned a lot. And um, thank you, dear listener, for staying with us throughout this In Bold podcast from Strategy End. As I said earlier, this was the first of a two-part conversation with these guys. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tune in again to the next one, where we'll be going deep. We'll be talking about key trends impacting the gaming industry. We'll be looking towards the future, what could be coming. And we'll be talking about some exciting topics like NFTs and how that impacts gaming. So, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And whilst you're there, leave us a review. And we'll see you soon on the next episode of In Bold.